what does this latest um, declare analyses tell us and what would you like clinicians to keep in mind when they're interpreting this data? Right, so in the, what we have demonstrated that in a very large population that actually uh, is about, I mean, population that contains both people with with the established cardiovascular disease or only with cardiovascular risk factor, which is the most of the type two diabetic patient, in those patients, treatment with dapagloxacin have reduced by nearly 50% the renal specific outcome, which is actually deterioration to end stage renal disease. It reduces by 70% the percent of a patient who had an end-stage renal disease. It was a very small number of patients, six versus 19, because most of the patients started with a normal kidney function. But the question, and, and we also demonstrated that altogether the effect of the drug could be shown in patients who have normal renal function and also in patients who are deteriorating with their renal function. Now, if you look at the effect of the whole group, you can see that the effect is very significant, but not very large. So we were looking, we were looking whether we can find those patients in whom we'll have a robust effect to to stop the, the deterioration to end-stage renal disease. And what we did, we looked at patients who have fast deterioration of kidney disease. And fast deterioration of kidney disease is characterized by deterioration of three or more, three or more milliliter per minute per year in the EGFR. Okay, and we found that in the declaring general, there were about 31% of the patient who deteriorated fast to end stage kidney disease, on the way to end stage kidney disease. Now, when we looked at the group of the, under dapagloxacin versus those under placebo, those under dapagloxacin, 26% have deteriorated. Those under placebo, 37% have deteriorated. So this is a very big difference. This means that in patients who are who have a progressive disease, the effect of the drug is robust and can reduce the risk by 30%, which is amazing. It's not preventing totally, but it's reducing the risk by 30%. Now, why is it important? This is mainly important because we don't know who will be the patient that will have that will have the, a great effect of the drug. Now, credence, credence study with canagliflozin have demonstrated that if you take patient who already have uh, end stage, who already have uh, uh, reduction in EGFR and the mean EGFR was 56. So those patients were on the way to end-stage renal disease. If you take those patients, you see a robust effect to prevent renal deterioration and mortality. But we wanted to see and declare who are the patients in whom you can start and treat at the very early stage and still have a great benefit. Because when you start to treat, when your EGFR is 50 or 40, you will postpone end-stage renal disease, but you will not stop it. So the time to treat is at a very early stage, when your EGFR is more than 90, or at least is between 60 to 90, or more than 75, when you are more or less normal. Now, because this drug has its cost, in spite of its great advantage, of reducing sugar, 
blood pressure, weight, no hypoglycemia, and the effect on beta cell to protect beta cell, many good effects of the drug, but still the drug costs money. So if you want to, if you want to have an effect on patient at the time when you can still prevent the disease, you have to know how to, how to recognize them in the clinic. And what I'm doing today after this, uh, what I've learned, I look at my patient EGFR on the last three years. If it's stable, I know that the effect of the drug to prevent deterioration will be small. It will still be there, but it will be small. But if I see deterioration within three years of 10, 10 milliliter per three years or more, I know that in this patient, I can do, I can, I can have a robust effect to prevent continuous deterioration of the kidney. So this is the main thing that this study have shown. Okay, thank you for that. And as I touched on a bit earlier, um, we're learning a lot about dapagliflozin and the SGLT2 class in general. Uh, what does this add? Obviously, a lot of what we've been hearing recently has been related to the cardiovascular benefits of dapagliflozin and DAPA-HF. What does this add to our understanding of SGLT2s? What we are learning is that this drug has an effect to reduce the pressure or other variables in the kidney, which are very important. We learned in the past that if we want to prevent the deterioration of the kidney, we have to treat with ACE inhibitors as early as possible. The moment we have microalbuminuria, or the moment we see a beginning of reduction in EGFR, we start with ACE inhibitor because ACE inhibitor reduced the pressure, the intraglomerular pressure. SGLT2 also reduced the intraglomerular pressure, but by another mechanism. And you need these two drugs together in order to prevent the kidney from deteriorating. And what we learn from, from Declare is that this drug can be effective at the very early stage of, of renal insufficiency, even with the mild microalbuminuria. Even with EGFR more than 90, there will be patients in whom the deterioration of kidney disease will be prevented. So the thing that we learn is we either give it to every patient because it's a very good drug in general, but if we have a cost, if a cost problem, a budget problem, we can locate who will be the patient who will mainly benefit in their kidney from this drug. It's similar in the heart. In the heart, there are two things. One is MACE. So we show, we show that in patients who have established cardiovascular disease, this drug can prevent recurrent of events, okay? But we also have shown that those family of drugs are mainly reducing, uh, uh, preventing heart failure in diabetic patients and mainly and, and non-diabetic patients, and mainly in those who have reduced ejection fraction. Now, we learned recently in DECLARE that by a special score that we developed, we can estimate who will be the patient without a heart disease that most probably will develop heart failure. So today, we can decide that certain patients who do not have heart failure, who do not have a cardiovascular, who do not have established cardiovascular disease, will highly benefit from the drug. So it's a kind of a score. You try to find those patients who will mostly benefit from the drug, either in the kidney or in the heart, in spite of the fact they do, that they do not have yet heart disease or kidney disease. And this is the most important thing, it's prevention. We always try to prevent by keeping good glucose levels. 
by normalizing the blood glucose level, by having hemoglobin A1C less than seven. Okay, but this is, first, it's not enough. And second, we know that in many patients, we, we don't achieve the hemoglobin A1C that we want in order to prevent uh, kidney and, and uh, heart uh, disease in the diabetic patient. So now we find a family of drugs that can not either, uh, that can not only uh, reduce dramatically events in patients with established cardiovascular disease, with established heart failure, with established renal failure. They can do it also in patients without established heart failure and without established renal failure. And, and the thing is, how can we find those who will mainly benefit from the drug? So in this study that is now published in the ADA, we actually show that those who are fast deteriorated are those who are mainly benefit from the drug, even, even if their EGFR is near normal as it was in most of the declared patients. 